Hi, uh, my name is Randall Brooks. I'm a Principal Engineering Fellow from uh, Raytheon Technologies, and uh, I am here uh, with uh, my good friend, uh, John Michael, and he'll introduce himself in a second, to talk to you guys about threat modeling uh, from architecture design application. I get to work a lot in what we call software, uh, software assurance, and we focus on building security in, into products, including threat modeling and all those wonderful things that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, in fact, I actually do uh, cyber learning and cyber training across the company. And it's uh, very happy to be here and talk to you guys today uh, about this topic. Excellent, and I'm John Michael Brook. Uh, I'm a principal architect at Starbucks and a cloud research fellow with the Cloud Security Alliance. I also chair our Top Threats Working Group and one of the uh, recent projects that we've worked on within that group is Cloud Threat Modeling. All right, so what one of the things we're gonna focus on is what is threat modeling? How does this really apply to what you do in your day in day life? Uh, you know, how to go about it. Sometimes it's very hard. In fact, I've uh, been teaching folks how to do threat modeling for a long time. And sometimes uh, it's just not for, for certain folks, but we're gonna hopefully give you things to think about as you go through uh, looking at applications that you're basically migrating or things that you wanna target for the cloud. How might you go about uh, thinking about that with respect to threat modeling? Now, for me, uh, I have to, uh, I, I, I get to work in uh, government type work. So we, we focus on things such as the NIST uh, Special Pub 800 series. And in the recent revision of five, which is focusing on their security controls, and we're gonna talk about cloud. So we're gonna talk about the cloud controls matrix, which is a similar set of controls that's out there. Uh, but one of the things they have in there is the systems and service acquisition 11, developer testing and evaluation. And this is focusing on really understanding your your attack surface. How might your systems uh, be attacked? Uh, how might you go about validating that uh, and so forth? And one of the things specifically as they call, call out here is threat modeling and vulnerability analysis. Now, uh, one of the things that they call out, which I think folks really struggle on is conducting threat analysis to a certain level of rigor. And that level of rigor is very difficult for folks to really understand. And how far, you know, how far do I keep going with my threat modeling? And we're hopefully going to have a good example for you guys upcoming that'll help you really understand uh, what's really meant by that and how you might be able to apply this and what you do. One of the things about threat modeling is you wanna focus on really a system centric or a defensive way of, of looking at a system. You really, as, a, as a, someone who creates systems, you wanna think about uh, any ways that the system could be interacted, what potential threats that might be, how likely, you know, what means would they might go about attacking you? Maybe you have an external interface or something along that line. Um, you know, how, what avenues would they be going through? Maybe they're, that you have a partner network that you communicate to and that partner network gives access into some of your backend systems. Then start to think about prioritizing um, the risks and start to mitigate those and then design that system out, uh, model it, start to decompose it, step through each section and then look uh, ways for various different attacks against that. One of the fun things we also get to do is uh, think about um, what an attacker really might do. Uh, you know, what is their techniques that they might go about attacking a system? And you're really gonna start to um, kind of, and I use this term a lot and it's in one of the slides, it's like building your think evil gene and thinking about how can you go about bringing this system down, thinking about how my attacker might subvert a system and, you know, really bring it, you know, bring it to its knees. Uh, so there's going to be certain goals that you'll want to do. Maybe it's going to be, um, you know, spoof a, a certain entity type or, uh, you know, reproduce certain credentials or something along that line. Uh, but there are certain goals that folks will want to get to. And as they break down those goals, they'll really understand how might that, uh, you know, what might be their avenue of attack and how it goes through. Now, a lot of times uh, the 
actual attack portion of the modeling happens as an output of the threat model. So folks might present their threat model and, um, you know, folks kind of skilled in the art, a lot of, you know, DEF CON attenders, those types of folks might take a look at that and say, you know, I can do this, this, and this, and I can attack your system and, and maybe potentially bring it down. Um, and so you'll look at all of those likely responses and what might the application go about to do to defend against that. Uh, now, as you do this, uh, you're going to actually produce something. And one of the things you'll produce is certain attack patterns. You might extend and put in, uh, come out with use cases, abuse cases, misuse cases, however you want to describe it, but basically all the bad things that could be done to a system uh, and so forth. And uh, one of the things we're going to delve into is attack trees and attack graphs. And so we're going to graph out a system. We're going to walk through that and talk about um, those types of attacks. Now, this is one of my uh, favorite slides. And uh, it, it really simplifies threat modeling into some specific ideas in that what is it that you want to protect? Who do you want to protect it from? How likely will you need to protect it? And that's always a hard one because that tends to go to probability of occurrence, right? And then how bad is it if you fail? And then of course, how much money do you have? How likely are you to go about to spend that kind of money to defend? Now you can't defend against everything. So that's why threat modeling is so important. You can't defend everything, right? So if you can focus on what's uh, you know, the highest probable thing that could potentially cause uh, damage to your system or application, then that's what you want to focus on. So these are the core things you really want to think about. Uh, now, I originally got this from uh, an MIT uh, course that was online, uh, but I've seen it reproduced in many different um, subjects. So uh, I, I, I do really like this kind of simple thought of what do you want to protect? Who do you want to protect it from? And how much money do you have? How likely will you need to protect that system. Now, uh, Microsoft uh, has done a great uh, service really to the industry and really thought about threat modeling. Uh, in fact, they have a whole tool to do said uh, threat modeling. So they came up with five uh, steps really to go through with respect to that because there is, it's not just the diagramming and, and really you know thinking about the system, but there's a lot more things to really consider. And one of the things that you wanna do is really kind of think about your requirements that you might have. Define all those, lay, and lay them out, maybe track them uh, in some sort of you know, tracking, requirements tracking database. Um, and then as you um, create that application, uh, then you can um, you know, diagram it out, uh, architect, you know, take an architecture, uh, lay it out, model the system, uh, come up with um, a you know particular threats that might go against the system. Now, of course, a lot of the stuff that we're going to emphasize later is on the work that the Cloud Security Alliance does, and so that'll really help with the identifying of threats, and then coming up with ways to mitigating uh, mitigating threats uh, with respect to that, and then validating that those threats uh, have been mitigated uh, over time. And we have a link down there to Microsoft's work in threat modeling. Uh, this is always an, uh, also another good one. Uh, we have overlaid here uh, some of the work that MITRE, the MITRE Corporation has done with respect to what they call making uh, security measurable. And one of the things they have in there is KPEC, their common attack pattern enumeration and classification. So the kind of, so what you're looking here is you're thinking about known threat actors. These are the guys that you know may potentially be targeting your, your system. Uh, what attacks might they go through? And Capex really good at helping you that. Also, uh, the MITRE attack framework is something to also consider. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then as you code your application, uh, you'll have uh, what we like to call common weakness enumeration. And those are potential things that you may become vulnerabilities. They're not yet vulnerabilities right now, but an attacker might be able to leverage that and create a specific vulnerability. Now, of course, you'll have other impacts uh, or other controls that you'll apply and that will have a resultant impact based on how you've applied those controls. And so we're trying to kind of get you to think about, you know, attacker does this bad thing to my code, but I've got this wonderful thing to protect it, or I'm in a defense 
in-depth scenario where I've got more than one layered control to mitigate that risk and mitigate that uh, as we go through time. All right, so we talked about um, attack models. Uh, so let's, let's give an example really here on what would this look like? Now, uh, attack modeling is fun. You get to assume the role of attacker. Uh, you know, you get to, uh, you know, take, you know, take a uh, look at each kind of threat and then apply those against your particular target. Uh, you know, you know, you don't need to go through the firewall if you can trick someone to do something, right? So however, you know, someone might go about getting their goals, they'll go step one, step two, step three, and what's depicted here is from a Microsoft article on basically how to obtain credentials over the network. But you'll go through various different um, steps that you'll go through trying to um, achieve what you would like to do. Uh, now, there's a lot of um, products out there that will help you walk through these types of things. And to be honest, I've, I've seen Visio, PowerPoint, you know, basically box and arrow and, and problem and so forth. Uh, now, the hard part is uh, getting to the uh, kind of the end state. Like, how do I understand that end state? Where do I need to stop? And that's what we're going to focus on here with uh, this next example. So... Uh, we're going to pretend it's Christmas time and it's time to watch a, a wonderful Christmas movie called Home Alone. And in it, surprisingly, you probably didn't know this, and at least we'll, we'll make the assertion, is an attack tree. And so we'll go through this example here and, and talk about how uh, each step that was done uh, in this particular set of attacks and how things went uh, from a defensive perspective and how uh, Kevin McAllister, who's going to, quote, defend his, his family home because he was left home alone, how is he going to go about to do that? So the way it's depicted here is really um, an attack defense, or you might use the word countermeasure, whichever is your appropriate term that you'd like to use. So an attack, countermeasure, attack, countermeasure and what's depicted over uh, over on the uh, right there is is really the whole graph laid out but one of the things that started off um, and the folks really um, uh, Harry and Marv they went and kind of looked out and kind of knocked on every door and said hey you know we're the police you know want to find out which kind of mechanisms you've got to uh, you know, defend your house uh, during this Christmas season. We'd hate for you to get robbed or something like that. So they're out there already, uh, you know, fingerprinting, figuring out what's out there, looking at the infrastructure and trying to understand, you know, what kind of defenses are in place. And their expectation is that no one's there. They'll be able to bust right in. Um, you know, there is no actual alarm. There's a sign that says, you know, you know, security system and so forth, but there's no actual alarm, right? So as they kind of start through uh, their little steps, uh, they have this goal, of course, this is the attacker's goal is to rob the McAllister's house. So the first thing they do, and they actually do find out that Kevin is there. So they actually go to a side door, uh, it's towards the back. Um, it's right by the kitchen and they kind of trick Kevin. They're like, you know, hey, we got some candy, open the door, you know, we're the good guys, let us in the house. And Kevin has already kind of thought about ways that he might be attacked. And he's laid out his defenses to mitigate any potential incursion by Harry and Marv. So the first thing he does is shoot Harry and Marv with the BB gun. Now, of course, that does help them learn that that was a huge mistake on their part. And they decide that, you know what we're going to do? We're going to uh, really double up our attack. Harry is going to uh, go around to the front door while Marv is going to go down to the basement door, which was actually right next to the door in which they started at. Now, um, Kevin is really thought this out and he's laid out his defense. He's put water on all the steps. So he's iced them up. They fall, they get hurt. Uh, you know, they're limping after this. They're both, uh, you know, uh, trying to reel from this event. Uh, but now what they do is they slowly walk up the stairs and kind of, you know, think about how they're going to attack as they go on. Uh, now, Marv uses, is actually fell all the way downstairs at this point. He's in the, the basement floor now and he uses a crowbar and he has some success and he enters the McAllister's house. Uh, unfortunately, he hasn't won yet. He's got a lot more to go, um, but he's making some success. And that does happen sometimes uh, in threat models. You'll, you'll come out with an attack defense, attack defense, and your uh, 
the person exploiting you might come up with maybe something that is a little bit successful. And, they'll, and as such, you'll want to keep going uh, with your, um, your attack, uh, attack tree. Now, um, as a defense, um, uh, Kevin uh, against, uh, for, for uh, Harry, uh, as he's uh, trying to enter the front door, uh, he uses a, an electric gr grill starter and burns Harry's hand. Uh, so that um, kind of stops Harry at that point. And one of the things you'll notice will have an, an, end of an end of attack. There are certain things you might do as defender that might cause the defender to just give up. This avenue is not going to work. Uh, maybe they're trying to fuzz a system or launch various different attacks, or they're trying to brute force your authentication strategy. Uh, you know, they're trying to denial of service your you know cloud service provider or whoever it is. You know, they're trying to uh, stop. And then there's a point in which that attack is just no longer going to work. But like I said, for Marv, he's had some success, and so uh, Marv uh, is. Um, entering the house, he's coming through the basement and Kevin drops a uh, iron uh, on, on Marv's head. Uh, he rigged it up, uh, burns Marv, of course, uh, but now he's still making some success. Uh, so he's gonna attempt to climb the basement stairs. Now finishing out Marv, um, one of the things that Kevin has done is besides destroyed his entire house at this point, um, has put tar on the ground and that this causes uh, things to get very sticky. He pulls, you know, loses his shoes and so forth. Just like if you're using things like honey pots, you might have tar pitting technology that might slow down your attacker and cause them uh, to maybe reveal themselves and so forth. Uh, now he's going to put, uh, you know, tar on there and he ends up stepping on a nail. And for some reason, he actually gives up at this point and his end of attack ends at that point. He's given up on the basement. He leaves and actually um, it comes up with a new, a new attack. Now, Harry's starting his new attack. Um, he's comes back around to that, that kitchen door where they first met uh, Kevin. They knock down that door. And, um, uh, but as he does open it up, uh, there's a flamethrower and it burns uh, Harry on the head. Now, um, now he's at least inside the house and he sees Kevin, he yells at him, he enters the dining room. Now, at the same time, Marv has went around to a window, opened the window. Kevin has laid out broken glass ornaments uh, to, uh, for, um, for him to step on. And of course he hurts his feet, uh, which he lost his shoes at the tar uh, and so forth. But uh, for Harry, uh, Kevin actually has a thing where he runs, he's chasing Kevin, he runs through, gets saran wrap all, uh, all over him and he blows feathers on him. Uh, at that point, they've decided that their two separate attacks is not gonna work. And so they're going to join forces, double up on the defense, and uh, attempt to uh, go up the stairs. Well, Kevin has placed micro mini machines, a great toy from the 80s, uh, slipping, or in the 90s too, but uh, slipping, fall, and they fall, hurt themselves, and so forth. But they're still, you know, uh, determined they are going to compromise this particular facility, this house, they want it. They're going to, um, you know, keep following Kevin up the stairs. Now he's going to swing cans. He actually swings them individually, misses one, but then hits, hits them later when he thinks he's dodged it. Um, now they're very wary of what Kevin's going to do. And as Kevin um, um, tries to defend against their attack, now they're slowly coming up the stairs, definitely moving slower, looking for things like they're always kind of like, you know, looking out, um, you know, what's going to get me next. Uh, so Kevin has set up a tripwire and he calls uh, the police to a neighbor's house, not actually to his own house, but a neighbor's house because Kevin is part of Kevin's defensive plan. That is the avenue in which he's decided to take. Now the attack, um, Marv does a uh, dive, uh, grabs Kevin's foot, uh, does get a hold of him, uh, but uh, luckily for Kevin, his brother's tarantula is available and he places that tarantula on, on Marv's head. Now, uh, the attack, uh, uh, they basically want to follow Kevin upstairs. Uh, Kevin has a defense where he's already set up a zip line to zip over to uh, the treehouse. And of course, they want to follow that zip line. But Kevin's defense has already got the scissors there, uh, shears to cut down that zip line uh, and so forth. So um, 
they're, they see Kevin going over to the neighbor's house. Now, since they have knowledge of this particular home, since they've already compromised it themselves, uh, they actually evade uh, as Kevin enters through the basement. Um, they end up capturing Kevin as he comes upstairs because they already knew uh, that he would uh, be there. So the question is, is did, uh, did they win? Uh, did they uh, achieve what they intended to do? Um, now, um, unfortunately not. Um, a neighbor actually comes to the rescue, hits uh, Harry and Marv on the head with a shovel. Uh, the police arrive. And at that point, it's really the end of attack. But um, so a question you might have is, I just spent five minutes and you told me about a Christmas movie. Uh, again, how, what does that have to do with um, cybersecurity? Now, uh, it's attack a defend, attack defend, and you'll go through this little steps uh, as you lay out your defensive infrastructure and how you deal and mitigate with potential attacks. Um, but the, the, the key thing that's really happened here is, is that all of these sequences really have delayed the usefulness of their attack. Now, they might, your attacker, might achieve some level of footprint onto your system. Maybe they've compromised one of your nodes. Uh, you know, maybe you have a certain cluster and, and so forth, but they've, it, it's taken them so long and they're able to you defend and detect what's being done here that it's no longer useful or maybe the data is out of date or so forth. But one of the things you wanna to try to do, to do with attack modeling is figure out that level of rigor. And if you can come up with that point, like, oh my gosh, they have to break encryption or to do so, we kind of lay out a software defined perimeter in implementing zero trust, which is a classic good way of defending cloud architecture. Uh, you know, for them to get access to that system is gonna be really, really hard for them to do that. All right, so getting back to uh, one of my favorites and I do this a lot. Um, this is actually an homage to the Batman threat model. Uh, I do encourage folks to search on the internet for the Batman threat model. Uh, so this is a time to emulate that. Uh, but um, as a defender and as an, a kind of a, a software person myself, uh, I know my system and I don't always know the evil things that attackers might do to my system. So um, I want to think that out and, um, you know, I want to think about, you know, what is that I want to protect? Who do I want to protect it from? How will am I going about to protect this? And really what's the consequences? And that's what we've got to draw out here. And in this particular case, uh, this is the, the Troy, um, uh, the Trojan threat model. And in this case, um, Paris uh, has Helen uh, in his city of Troy. And he is under siege, uh, under attack by the Greeks who are very, very much upset with the fact that Helen has been taken. And so um, King Agamemnon's army is coming to uh, fight. And, you know, armies to armies, um, you know, that would be, you know, pretty, you know, one for one, right? And in, in, in this particular case, they've got these walls protecting their, you know, protecting them. They've got provisions, you know, they can hold up to a siege for a very long time. Uh, now, unfortunate, you know, for them, they have, um, you know, the Greeks have Achilles. And if you add Achilles to the army, it really becomes really a moderate level or a medium level risk uh, with respect to uh, what's going on here. Unfortunately for them, they did not know uh, about the threat and the gift um, that's going to be coming for them, which is the Trojan horse. And it's always that one thing we did not forget or uh, think about. And that is the thing that ends up becoming the high threat, uh, really allowing folks to compromise uh, our, our situation. Now, um, as folks start to think about this and like, okay, I, you know, maybe I know what I want to protect and who do I want to protect it from, and I have an idea of how willing am I going about protect it. What's a good way for me to think about doing this? Now, this comes from the Microsoft threat modeling uh, way of thinking about it, and it's the stride methodology. In this particular case, you'll look at ways things can be spoofed. Uh, maybe someone might tamper with data uh, as that data transmit from certain objects. So if you have an application and a server or a service that you're interacting with, um, you know, can someone spoof it? Someone can tamper with that data. Is there a way for them to cryptographically say that there's someone who they are not and violate repudiation? 
Uh, will I be giving up um, any kind of particular data, any inf you know, information disclosure uh, and so forth? Uh, you know, will I have denial of service or elevation of privilege? Now, um, as we really think about all what all this threat modeling is, uh, we're starting to move the cloud. Uh, is there any difference? Uh, you know, how does affect uh, you know how does this affect our attackers, uh, software assets, uh, and so forth? Thanks, Randall. Uh, so Randall's going to be available for any questions that we have uh, that you have during the uh, the next few minutes here. Um, so as you mentioned, you know we're moving to the cloud, right? We're now dealing with attackers, software, assets that we don't necessarily completely own. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance and the Top Threats Working Group that, I, uh, that I'm involved with. And here you see a couple of the, uh, the, the, the products on the right-hand side that the Top Threats Working Group has put out. So the Cloud Security Alliance uh, 2010, they just had their 11th anniversary. COVID was a great time for uh, having a party. So 92,000 members, uh, 300, over 300 uh, organizations, and there are a ton of products that have come out of that particular organization. Cloud controls matrix, uh, the enterprise architecture, privacy level agreements. Um, we'll talk about, uh, you know, we won't talk about the CAKE and the CCSK, but we will talk about the uh, collaboration site you can go on to Circle and see everything for the top threats community, right? And so we put out several surveys across the years, and yes, they all have cute little names. The Notorious Nine, there was a Sinister Seven, Treacherous 12, and most recently, the Egregious 11. So that's part of a survey that we put out there, and we send it out to uh, cloud participants, and we say, hey, what do you see as the biggest risks to, uh, well, to cloud security. And so we get those, uh, you see that deep dive case studies, we'll talk about that a little bit more. There've been two of those that we've published and then that uh, cloud penetration testing playbook, playbook. That is something that would have caught the uh, Capital One breach if it had been used. So all great research. Uh, most recently, we've been working on something, uh, this cloud threat modeling uh, aspect and then there's something about a deeper dive uh, partnership effort that uh, if we have enough time, I'll try to cover off on a little bit. So all of this, uh, we, we, we get into this cloud controls matrix, uh, basically a matrix of controls for the cloud. And this is one of the bigger products that the CSA puts out. Uh, you see there are 17 domains for their cloud controls matrix version 4.0. That came out, and I want to say maybe three months ago. And so fresh, hot off the press, um, you see on the right-hand side there, the application and interface security, uh, I believe it's seven. And that particular uh, domain, that particular control, uh, you, you, you start getting into uh, some of the aspects of uh, threat modeling and where you would put those into your organization and where you would control for those within a cloud environment. So as I mentioned, the top threats uh, working group, well, we put together a fun little, uh, uh, fun little paper here, uh, cloud threat modeling. Anybody that uh, can call out what that is on the, uh, on the side there will get some definite kudos from us. Um, so as far as the move to cloud goes, we've got a shared responsibilities, right? And the, the, the real proposition, you know, the crux comes down to this. Is it possible to allow developers to develop, right? They don't have to worry about which cloud service provider is cheapest. They don't have to worry about CSP lock-in. They don't have to worry about any of those aspects. Is it possible just to allow them to go do their thing and the security team and the governance risk and compliance team will take care of all of the security protections, right? All of the controls that are necessary is that a possibility if they want to put it into uh, Azure or AWS, if they want to put it onto an IaaS or to a SaaS, it doesn't matter, it's just taken care of. And that's the ultimate goal. Can that happen? We'll see, but we laid out a methodology there. You see those four steps. Developers do what they do, right? And so part of this uh, came out, we started looking at this 
uh, threat modeling, uh, we came up with a set of cards, right? We, we wanted to figure out uh, between the threats, vulnerabilities, assets, you know, what kind of controls, what kind of threats, what kind of vulnerabilities we should be looking at, how we can describe them, how we can convey that information quickly so that you can use a technique like what Randall uh, laid out in the, in the, uh, the, the, the previous section. And so all of that home alone, you know, he talked about the vulnerabilities, he talked about the, uh, the threats and the countermeasures, right? Well, those would go back into the controls. We know the impact. Lo and behold, they get in, they steal everything and they, uh, they, they hurt Kevin. So, all right, as far as the, uh, the threat modeling cards go, we put quite a bit of time into this, but we didn't wanna define everything, right? The whole idea is there's a lot of extra work out there. You know, you've got stuff that came out of NIST. Uh, Randall mentioned MITRE a little earlier. You've got their CVE and their attack framework. Uh, Carnegie Mellon has done quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of good work in this. And you know, there's some there, there's some other products from the Cloud Security Alliance. Their uh, CCAK, which is an Auditor Knowledge Certification. You know, there, there's an impact identification and a method of using, lo and behold, some of the other top threats working group materials to, well, help you threat modeling. And so all of this started with, uh, with our deep dive, which you know, was an effort to uh, better quantify, you know, better express the, the risks that were associated that we were coming up with in these, uh, in these surveys. Well, how do we show what that really is in a, in a true threat vulnerability uh, matter, right? Threats has a very real, uh, real definition and you know, wasn't being used quite properly in the top threats working group. Our team knew that that was the case and really wanted to figure out how to, uh, how to clean that up. So here you've got this Dow Jones case, You've got AWS. I, I said you can, you know, have whichever service provider it is. We can still threat model against it. Uh, we have an Elasticsearch database. Okay, well, those are aspects that we're going to look into. If I were to go take care of, a, you know, do a Shodan search and take a, a take a look at a couple of uh, products that are out there, lo and behold, hey, I can find a couple of servers that are in Amazon, uh, that are in Azure. These are both in the U.S. and start modeling, start coming up with assets and descriptions that go along with them. Both of them have that same Elasticsearch capability. One's built on maybe a corporate image, right? CIS hardened on AWS, whereas the other is a self-managed Elasticsearch. Uh, maybe it's an IaaS image that comes from the, uh, the, the vendor, right? These are all things that go back into uh, the overall threats that are that are potentially uh, successful against these systems because there are vulnerabilities that will be associated specific to those assets. Again, we want our developers to develop. We don't want them to have to worry about the assets. We don't want them to have to worry about the vulnerabilities that go with each one, right? So at that point, we can start looking at, you know, these assets, what's the provenance? What's the pedigree? Where do they come from? Who owns them? Who puts them together? What do we have to worry about within each one of these assets, within each one of these uh, systems, you know, within each one of these cloud service providers? So we, we, you know, we look at things like uh, connected versus disconnected systems. If I have uh, an express route or a direct connect back into my infrastructure, right, back into my corporate data center, because I am running some sort of hybrid cloud, that's going to have a different set of controls that I need to put in place in order to keep my overall security posture uh, for, well, for risks in general, right? Uh, here we've got a couple of examples. Uh, we will we'll drill in. You've got uh, the hosted Elasticsearch and a corporate image that we're looking at. So a SAS and an IaaS. And, and, and we'll start considering these against vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities are going to be, well, across the board. Some of them are going to be very specific to a very specific service provider, right? If I have a misconfiguration that goes in and will affect a SAS, a PaaS, and an IaaS, 
fantastic. But some of them are only going to be appropriate for SaaS environments. And I can start marrying those up uh, against the assets that I have. And eventually I'm going to come up with, uh, here are a couple of examples. Here's a, a SPI, you know, we've got a SAS, a PAS, and an IAS in there. And maybe they aren't appropriate, right? We, we see that uh, in the middle there, that IAS isn't going to work against a PAS environment. So from that standpoint, we can start whittling down which of these vulnerabilities we need to worry about. So one of the things that we've noticed, uh, that, that we noticed in creating this uh, document and creating this uh, threat modeling guide, right? We noticed that there were some issues as far as the uh, naming convention. So that threat modeling consistency, we were able to use, you know, as, as far as the assets go, as, as far as the vulnerabilities go, you know, there's been a lot of great work against those other pieces. Controls, you've got the CCM, you've got NIST, you've got the International Standards Organization. You know, all of them are out there. They've defined all of this. In our past top threats documents, we're looking at things like downloading bad code versus falling victim to social engineering versus business email compromise fraud. None of those have any sort of consistency. So we put a little bit of uh, time in and effort in and we said, all right, look, here's something that we could put together. You know, you define a type, an actor, some sort of verb and an object, and then what it's going to result in. And so this is something that uh, we'll, we'll propose in, uh, in going forward in the future top threats working, uh, working group activities and outputs. We'll actually be coming up with another survey here uh, coming out and that will replace the uh, egregious 11 uh, moving forward. So from, from that, uh, you see a couple of examples on the right there, malicious bot injects SQL code and a password's breached, right? So going back, we can start cataloging this overall list of threats and well, move forward from there. So with that, uh, again, any questions, uh, please feel free to include those in the, uh, the chat. We will definitely be answering those as quickly as possible. And Randall, if you will bring it home and tell everyone what they can do next. All right, so over the next week, one, you know, really think about uh, the, what we've said here with respect to threat modeling. Pick a system, uh, pick something that you're going to be moving to the cloud. Um, however you're going to be, do it, be doing that, um, you're gonna be moving to a cloud service provider, start to really think about how might I go about um, you know, creating a threat model, think about which one to protect, who to protect it from, and how likely will you need to protect it. So in, in the first three months, following this presentation, Look, there's a very nice layout of next steps, right? And hopefully, if you guys are already involved with the, uh, with the CSA or you are familiar with that cloud controls matrix, go ahead and see if you can start utilizing that to create some mitigations against those threats. And then definitely think about as you get into six months further down the road, as you've um, you know, thought about those mitigations, thought about your threat models, go back and validate that threat model. Make sure it's still valid. It's still current with what's going on today. And, and last but not least, look, the, the, the top threats working group, we're putting out a lot of, uh, a lot of good work, um, a lot of good uh, research. You see that 2020, 2021 survey, that'll be coming out by Black Hat of this year at least estimated, um, I, I would expect that that will, that that will become the next, whatever the replacement is for the egregious 11. We're also looking at gamification, gamification of the uh, threat modeling. So how you can quantify, how you can put some scorecards together. And then there'll also be a, uh, another deep dive that comes out as well as some additional, uh, maybe even deeper like Mariana's Trench uh, style deep dive uh, work that will be uh, going forward. So with that, we definitely appreciate your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. And if you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And if not, happy that you, uh, you, you attended our session and we look forward to meeting you in the future, hopefully in, in meet space, right? All right, thank you. Thanks again.